Okay. Still and I have decided to split in half between the two of us the many different aspects of this huge topic. As I was at graduate school in America during the Bush Gore catastrophe, and then, which was an election technology failure actually, and then subsequently through the 2004 election in which they thought it would be a brilliant idea to replace all of their old fashioned manual punch card voting systems with computers that accepted a vote, produced an answer later, and provided no evidence whatsoever that any of the votes that had been received on the touch screen matched the announced result at the end. So I'm going to start by describing what a debacle the United States is, so that everybody in Australia can feel smug. Then I'm going, in the second half of my talk, to describe a little bit about Australian electronic election conduct. Probably some things that you don't know, and by the end, I think we'll all feel a bit less smug. So here we go. Uh, there's a great article just recently in the New York Times entitled, In Election Interference, It's What Reporters Didn't Find That Matters. And uh, this is a great title because it's exactly what I think the important theme in electronic election conduct is. If you run your election using a bunch of computers and everything seems to be okay, then that doesn't prove anything at all. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. Because the real risk with an electronic election system is that there's some kind of accidental software error, error or surreptitious manipulation that isn't evident. Not to the people running the system and certainly not to the voters or candidates or scrutineers. So, a large part of the theme of what is now gradually emerging in articles about American, um, the American presidential election from 2016 is that the extent of deliberate Russian attempts to manipulate the system was much greater than was ever properly acknowledged at the time. And there's been this gradually leaking out of more and more information about what happened. So some of you might have seen an NSA leak to The Intercept a good few months ago that said, Russian military intelligence executed a cyber attack on at least one US voting software supplier and sent spear phishing emails to more than 100 local election officials just days before last November's presidential election. It goes on to say that the actors likely used data obtained from their, um, their hacking operation to launch a voter registration themed spear phishing campaign targeting US local government organisations. So, Think of the setup here, right? American democracy is actually administered in a very distributed way. Just about every little local county has its own little mini election administration service that runs its own election. And this very diversity has been used as an argument that the system is actually quite robust and that it would be hard for a malicious party to attack lots of them at once. What becomes evident from reading this report is that one company was actually selling IT support services and back-end software solutions to a vast number of different local electoral authorities all over the country. And so by breaking into one such company that had influence over a whole lot of different counties, the Russian attackers were actually able to get a great deal of data and possibly to have a great deal of influence, at least on voter registration and access. Although there's no specific evidence that they had any um, effect on the actual votes or counts of the votes. Okay, so at the time, many of you may remember, there was a considerable amount, considerable amount of kind of ambiguity and denial about the extent of Russian interference in that electoral process. Uh, very recently it was reported, so this is from the 22nd of September, i.e. only last week. The US government tells 21 states that hackers targeted their voting systems. Uh, this is another article from the New York Times. It says the federal government on Friday told election officials, that's Friday two weeks ago, told election officials in 21 states that hackers targeted their systems before last year's presidential election. The government didn't say who was behind the hacking attempts or provide details about what had been sought. Um, note that the keyword here is targeted, so there's still not any admission of actually successfully breaking in and changing anything. But 
21 out of 50 is enough to target just about any state that has any chance of actually being switched one way or the other, remembering that a good 20 or 30 US states are highly predictable and really not worth trying to break into. So we see a pattern of serious attempts to break into systems. We see if you look at the United States, that particular election, that what there's actually information about is not necessarily targeting the voting machines or even the vote counting machines, but targeting voter registration databases and messing around with who was registered to vote, where they were registered to vote, whether they were eligible to vote in particular places. And you would have seen very long lines that are typical of US elections. And the question is, to what extent were those long lines and those people who were turned away manipulated by what we're now hearing about in terms of Russian interference with voter registration databases? Um, so there are lots of interesting themes here. Number one is the amusing trick of addressing your political issues by excluding people from the voter rolls has been a long running theme in American democracy for decades and decades and decades. Usually is an Americans only game though, right? The amusing game of making sure that you don't set up enough polling places in black neighborhoods for African Americans to actually get around to voting and this kind of thing. This has gone on for a very long time in the United States. Now we're seeing the specific allegation that those same kinds of tricks might possibly have been used by a foreign power to manipulate some particular counties and to produce long lines that excluded some Americans from voting in a way that didn't suit that foreign power's political preferences. So nobody really knows for sure whether this was actually successful or not, partly because those long lines and software glitches are such a regular part of American election conduct that it's very hard to tell whether any particular bad event was the result of Russian manipulation or whether it was just usual American stuffing around. But at least the allegation that the Russians deliberately manipulated these kinds of issues is serious and fairly credible. I don't think anybody will really know what actually happened. I don't think anybody will ever really know whether there was also manipulation of the actual computers that were used to record or tally the votes. Uh, in most cases, there probably isn't even evidence available of whether or not that might have happened. The only actual evidence that I know anything about is from a partial recount in the state of Wisconsin. So you might remember there were three states in which Jill Stein tried to get a recount. Um, Philadelphia, Wisconsin and, sorry, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan. Pennsylvania mostly doesn't have paper records of any kind, so there was nothing to recount. Um, Michigan has a bunch of offensive laws which roughly say, if you think there's something dodgy about the election and you want a recount, then first you have to prove that there's something wrong with the tally and then you can go looking at the paper evidence to see whether there was anything wrong with the tally. Um, so the only state that actually did any significant recounting was uh, Wisconsin. And there's a beautiful report that you can find on the web about the partial recounts that they did. It says, did Donald Trump actually carry Wisconsin or was the election miscounted? Unfortunately, nobody will ever know. Wisconsin did recount more than the two other states where we sought verification. The 51 counties that had hand counted ballots successfully confirmed the outcome in their counties. So this, they're doing a manual recount of paper ballots voted on by voters. But those counties only account for 52.8% of the ballots cast. Unfortunately, a valid recount of only 51 out of 72 counties could still miss an outcome altering miscount. So even in the state that did the most manual recounting, there isn't really any good information that conclusively demonstrates that we got the right answer. Okay, so just to summarize the American situation, I see a few interesting themes. First of all, there might actually be serious problems that aren't made known to the public or aren't detected at all. What you see is not all there is. Number two, it's really hard to distinguish incompetence from conspiracy. In other words, something that, a problem that appears to be there 
might become evident, but even if it becomes evident, it's going to be very, very hard to tell whether it's the deliberate result of manipulation or intentional fraud, or whether it's just your classic um, computer, computer glitch, software problem, or accidental human error. In fact, uh, deliberate manipulation, if it was clever, could be carefully designed to hide under an accidental kind of glitch. You could deliberately design your deliberate attempts at manipulation to take the form of some kind of accidental error that people were expecting. Uh, and indeed, even just the threat or pretense of a successful attack could itself be a way of undermining the election. Ironically, some of the long queues in North Carolina were actually caused because the state, I think being nervous about the integrity of the electoral rolls, ordered every, uh, ordered some of the jurisdictions to go back to paper, but they weren't set up or properly staffed or properly trained or organised to do paper electoral rolls, which take a great deal longer to mark off than electronic ones. So the reversion to paper rolls itself caused a whole lot of really long lines that in turn turned some people, probably turned some people away from voting. Third point, the vulnerabilities that are present in the system and have been used by Americans against themselves can in turn be used by others. There's probably a lesson in there about backdoor encryption, but that's not supposed to be the topic of today's talk. Uh, and fourth, an apparently diverse and robust system that looks like it's got lots and lots of independent parts might actually have a, a few points of considerable control. You know, one contractor might actually be servicing lots of different places. But there's really only one solution, and that is to design the electoral system so that it provides verifiable evidence of having got the right answer, regardless of what kind of software problems there might have been. And so there's a large movement in the United States to make sure that all of their voting machines produce a voter verifiable paper record or, or that people vote on paper in the first place and that they get properly audited or manually recounted to check that there hasn't been a problem. So this kind of approach to design the electoral system from the beginning so that it does give people evidence of the right answer is really the only way to deal with any of this kind of trouble. Okay, which leads me to Australia. Um, who's used a computer in an election in Australia? Nobody at all, right? Who thinks there aren't any computers used in elections in Australia? Lots of people who actually think it but realise that I wouldn't have asked the question if the answer was comforting. <laughs> um, actually there are lots of computers in use in all kinds of electoral processes in Australia. The idea of running our elections over the internet goes exactly, flies exactly in the face of this idea of trying to provide evidence that it gets the right answer. And what we've seen in New South Wales over a series of different deployments is demonstrable places where third parties have the power to alter other people's votes. So we found in 2015 when Alex Haldeman and I looked at the state election implementation for New South Wales, that they, had, they were bringing some analytics code in from a third party service that hadn't configured their TLS implementation correctly. Uh, what that means is that somebody with a connection between the third party analytics service and the, sorry, someone who was on the internet between the third party analytics service and the voter could intercept the JavaScript that was supposed to just record some analytics about what the voter was doing and send it back to a third party, because that's a great idea in a voting system. Um, and instead of doing that relatively innocuous reporting, could change the JavaScript code into something that found out how the person wanted to vote and cast a different vote instead. So that was fixed after we reported it, but by that time, about 66,000 votes had already been cast. There was a similar kind of an issue in the 2017 West Australian state election, although uh, it wasn't an opportunity for any third party on the internet to interfere. It was an outsourcing of trust in that system to a third party um, content provider. iVote has a fairly primitive but at least existent verification service. After you've voted, you can telephone 
a totally trustworthy third party and you can tell it your login credentials for your internet voting service and then it reads back to you the vote that the Electoral Commission has recorded on your behalf. If you, if you don't like what you hear, you can press a little button that says, well, that wasn't right. And then somehow this is supposed to give the authorities an indication of how much of a problem there might have been in the conduct of the election. In the fallout from the 2015 state election, the Electoral Commission said on their website, very proudly and plainly, 1.7% um, of electors used the verification service. None of them reported any anomaly with their vote. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Because in, in order to access your vote and retrieve it from the verification service, you had to remember a 12-digit receipt number that you'd been given. So it seems a little bit surprising that 5,000 people would successfully remember a 12-digit receipt number, but you never know. Um, anyway, one of the officials was asked during the subsequent parliamentary inquiry how many people um, tried to verify their vote and failed. And he said, oh, well, actually seven people, um, seven people pressed the button to say that it wasn't the vote that they intended. But we telephoned two of them and they said they didn't mean to. So that makes five. And then the, the MP sort of said, well, well, retrieving the wrong vote is only part of the problem though, right? How many people, because if someone had manipulated your vote, they might have given you the wrong receipt number and then you wouldn't be able to retrieve any vote at all. So how many people tried to verify and failed to retrieve any vote at all out of the 5,000 odd who called? And he said, oh, oh, only four or 500. So four or 500 is about 10%. And 10% of the quarter of a million votes that came over iVote is a lot of failures. Um, if assuming that that verification failure rate is extrapolated to the whole set of votes. So I think this picks up on the theme that we've seen that when there are problems in an electronic election, they might not necessarily become obvious to the scrutineers. They might not necessarily be evident at all even to the electoral officials. Even if they are evident to the electoral officials, they might not be properly reported, maybe because they don't understand or maybe because they don't have an incentive to report that they themselves have made a mistake. Um, and in that case, anyway, there are other kinds of mistakes that could happen with that system that aren't detectable at all. Okay, so in my last minute and a half, I'm going to talk about the Senate count, right? Who knew that they use computers in the Senate count? Yes. You fill in your paper ballot with a pencil. This paper ballot gets scanned with an optical character recognition system that transforms it into an electronic list of your preferences. And then that gets counted electronically on source code that the AEC refuses to make available to the public. But the really important part of that process is actually to make sure that the paper ballots are accurately digitised because we can recount the preferences once they're up online but we can't necessarily check the paper ballots if we don't have access to them. So a suggestion for making that part of the process verifiably accurate is just to do a random audit of the pieces of paper against the preferences that they put on the web. So once they've published them, to go and choose some random fraction of them and see whether they match. It doesn't have to be all of them, but it has to be enough to give some kind of statistical confidence that the results they've announced are right. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we should make sure that the electoral process doesn't leave gaps in which a serious problem might go unreported or unnoticed. This is a difficult design problem that really has to be thought into the electoral process from the very beginning. Uh, to make sure that it produces evidence that it gets the right answer, even though we shouldn't be trusting any of the computers that are used in the election. And just in case you're wondering whether the people are rational in this space, uh, you might be curious to know that the Estonian internet voting system, which is the largest internet voting system in the world as a fraction of uh, total voting population, uh, recently suffered a bit of a setback. Somebody showed that their digital 
ID system is vulnerable to compromise. In other words, the, the little cards that people use to prove that they are an eligible voter can be copied. Um, although there aren't very many details about this, so this is the allegation, I'm not exactly sure exactly what can be done. A recent survey found that this hasn't affected confidence in the integrity of the internet voting system at all. The election's on the 15th of October, so we'll see.